Hi, right, so today I'm talking again to Dr. Alice Jones, uh, the author of the Better World Shopping Guide, uh, which for those of you who don't know, is a handy little pocket-sized book you can take with you when you go shopping, uh, which has got kind of A plus to F ratings for all the common brands, uh, based on their ethical performance. And um, so, Alice, we, we met, last time we met was uh, just over a year ago, I think, when you came to London. Um, just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how that visit went and what you've been That's right. doing since then. Well, um, gosh, it's been a little while. Um, I've been uh, plugging away at the uh, third edition. No, the fourth edition this will be. Uh, the third edition had just sold, um, right when it came out, just over 100,000 copies. So I've been working on the fourth edition, uh, updates and um, getting new sources and also um, more efforts growing in the field. So, for example, Good Guide seems to be doing quite well. Um, I just talked with the head of CSR Hub yesterday. They have an excellent um, research project going on that is similar to my own, but it's really in the middle of updating the Better World Shopper app as well. So the update is just I think go hoops and is about to kind of come out uh, in the next month or two, so that people using the uh, Better World Shopper app will have um, something more interesting uh, and updated to work with. Right. So, what um, fill us in a little bit about um, what the app does? Because I've uh, mentioned your book already, um, but is the app mostly the the same content? So, yeah. Well, the app is actually a boiled down version of. Of the book actually uh, allows you in some ways to do more than than the book offers. It doesn't have the sample data on kind of the green hero and the corporate villain. It doesn't have the tips and the website for you to go and experience. And on top of that, it has um, it has the ability to search. You can search um, by just typing in uh, the brand name or the company. You can quickly. Obviously, it's very easy. It's self-contained, uh, a self-contained app, so it doesn't even need to connect to the internet. Once you've downloaded the app, um, it's ready to go, um, no matter where you are. I find that I use the app more than the book at this point, to be honest, because uh, you know I'm not always carrying the book around in my back pocket, and so the app allows me to run around to whatever store I'm in and just quickly figure out, you know, what is my best option in this particular okay um so you just mentioned as well that you've um been talking to some other organizations and and other potential sources of information for your research um maybe you'd like to just kind of give us some ideas about how how the research landscape is changing is is there more information available now is is the format changing or you know how how's your process changing there is more information available but what i'm finding is that um you know, as these efforts gain popularity, like Good Guide and like CSR Hub, it becomes more apparent to me that at some point projects need to, there needs to be a really a sit down. Um, it's not that all of the groups have to come together to create a single ranking system, which is a kind of, you know, hopefully some, but at the very least, we should not not be giving consumers if our information is slightly different you know based on how our system uh, work I think that's one thing that's I think that's completely fine um, you're cross-checking your sources however if your one source of information is telling you that a company a is is doing great and another says that company a is doing awful it really you know puts consumers in uh, effort that is completely untenable mm. so at some point um, we're going to have to reconcile this. I'm already ta in talks now with CSR Hub to compare our, our uh, rankings around companies and see where we differ and try to discover why we differ in these ways mm -hmm. and hopefully reconcile the system so that uh, uh, they do not kind of generate these differing results. Uh, I think the same has to be done with a good guide and with, with most of the ranking systems that, that are out there for consumers because um, otherwise I don't, I don't think we have um, long-term prospects that are very good. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, one of the exciting things that has been happening more recently and probably since we last spoke is here in the U.S., um, academia is finally uh, taking note of ethical consumerism. So um, it turns out that uh, the political science departments were the first to discover um, 
consumerism. Here it's called political consumerism, which d- doesn't make that much sense to me. But you know, being political scientists who discovered this, uh, you know, they have kind of named it as such. And so there's there's actually quite a bit of research coming out of political science. There's also um, budding research coming out of uh, other aspects of the social science uh, community, including sociology. And so this actually bodes for quality research, uh, uh, ultimately, to help consumers. And I think this is the bottom line, is that is that part of what we have to talk about in these roundtable discussions is trying to separate out major issues like, you know, what is the difference between um, perceptions and uh, activity on the ground? So, um, for example, I, with my system, I am very strict about um, measuring the actual ground, um, whether they're perceived to be green or, or not to be green, actually uh, doesn't matter to me. As long as they are doing uh, the right thing on the ground, that is the data that I'm uh, going to communicate to consumers. Mm. I think the problem with a lot of the data out there, and there's more and more data being generated by the business, business data and the investment community, is that a significant amount of this uh, relies on perceptions and reputation. So is your up, or is the public perceiving you as uh, better? Uh, and another part of it is um, a number of issues getting kind of mixed into the pot. Uh, so while I have kind of stuck with the environment, human rights, social justice issues, community uh, involvement in animal protection, which are kind of you know fairly standard, you know suddenly um, people are adding in um, oh um, profitability or governance issues having to do with employees that may not um, uh, be kind of quite uh, on along the line of like um, equal treatment or, or how well they're taken care of, but rather mm-hmm. kind of on the fringes of, oh, um, I think we really have to start to come to terms with um, how we're going about assessing these companies because as more data becomes available, it becomes more important to really sift out what is the quality hard data versus a kind of free floating data in which um, business are, businesses may be rating each other or rating reputations? Mm. So, so you've been kind of addressing that so far by these round ta- table discussions you talked about. So, presumably, where you differ, where your ratings differ, that's some kind of sign of how the underlying mechanism is is different in some ways. So I guess that's a kind of interesting thing to discuss and to to refine together. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've just started out with these talks, so it's going to take some time to really get to the bottom of it. I just, some of this is coming from um, having to do with perceptions and having to do with with, um, research that we haven't dug into deeply enough. Um, It's important, you know, this is such a complex system, and ultimately... the biggest problem that we and so you know given that 90% of the data is completely unknown we're trying to piece together these pictures of social and environmental responsibility uh, based on these little snippets of data that come from the nonprofit world or the government sector or, or um, the private sector and uh, I think what we're beginning to see is um, a bit of the greenwashing that we've seen in in the kind of PRtizing, begin to kind of infiltrate more deeply into of research and um, um, rating of, of companies. So there are a lot of mechanisms out there already that kind of provide um, what I would call like um, white noise, uh, a lot of static mm-hmm. that, um, uh, cr- you know, we'll say, for example, I'll give you this example. I Harvard Business School not long ago, social uh, enterprise conference. And, you know, one of the big uh, companies being lauded was uh, Coca-Cola for their efforts. And um, uh, most of the indicators out there show that Coca-Cola, while they may be doing good things here and there, like any company, you know, like Walmart, like whoever, in the grand scheme of things, in the big picture from, from everything we know, overall, that company is not doing very well. Um, definitely not as as uh, a kind of uh, socially responsible trendsetter, mm-hmm. and and yet this is part of the information that that is is being um, uh, put out into the world of uh, ethical consumption. So I think th- these are our new challenges to really get down to brass tacks on what the hard data uh, allows us to see about you know uh, the the kind of good guys and the bad guys and mm. those that are some. 
Yeah. So so um, it sounds like a, a lot of the, the task then is kind of greenwash filtering of trying to figure out um, whether a particular source is actually useful, whether it's just greenwash or whether it is actually a useful indicator of, of that company's actual ethical performance. So so you're saying there's I mean, there's kind of more data out there, but but there's more greenwash out there as well. Yeah, I mean, so there's more data, but it's it's generally not perhaps as high quality as the original data. And part of that is that the vast majority of the original data used to come out of nonprofit organizations that had, you know, a fair bit of integrity mm-hmm. around what they were investigating and how they were doing it. Um, and now a significant chunk of data is coming out of the business community that has all kinds of competing interests um, uh, uh, not just is not just uh, for them to you know get the highest quality of information. Um, you know they have to do it within a certain budget. They may also have friends or ties to other organizations or businesses that make them want to see things a certain way and bias their results in other ways. And you know I think part of the problem. Uh, uh, that we're seeing is is a little bit that we're seeing globally. Like for example, you know the U.S. just got its um, investment rating uh, um, by the uh, people at S and P. So from a triple A rating to a double A plus. Yeah. Um, and uh, services like Moody's were also the ones that were rating these banks, you know, AAA, uh, when their kind of investment status and their liquidity was actually much lower and much more problematic. And I think what we're starting to see is some of that bleeding over into the social responsibility realm so that um, what you have are um, a number of these organizations. Uh, that kind of rate companies based on all you know a huge infrastructure um, with all kinds of money coming in and all kinds of institutional status and weight within the business community uh, beginning to meetings and yet I don't think um, if you really dig in deep to uh, understand the data behind those ratings I think you'll see some some fairly significant flaws which is a Exactly what we've seen with the rating system. I mean, this is something that the whole of the global business community has relied on for decades. And yet, um, in recent years, with the original financial crisis and now with the downgrading of, of uh, uh, the U.S. government status, um, we've seen that that um, these giant rating services, which are supposed to have the top researchers behind them, are kind of rife with problems. And, um, in fact, their status and power uh, creates a situation in which um, have problems developed because they don't have the transparency and accountability um, that some of these smaller efforts have to have to kind of prove their legitimacy. So when Tronics report uh, on you know toxic use uh, of, of plastics and so forth within the electronics industry, they have to be incredibly transparent because no one's going to take them seriously unless they can see the hardest and most detailed data that they are working with and having having done that, people now respect that particular piece of research that Greenpeace is up to. And uh, that's what we're lacking with some of these larger entities in the in the socially responsible ratings field. And so that will be a really important mm. step in the future. Yeah. So do you think that translates through then to kind of consumer facing um, services that are perhaps only providing a, a certain level of transparency, uh, only a certain down to a certain level, but not really showing the kind of underlying statistics or data or evidence that they're that's exactly the it. on? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly Exactly. In fact, you know, kind of home oh, problematic illusion of transparency. So it looks like you're transparent, but as soon as you kind of go past a certain level, suddenly you hit a wall that says, oh, this comes from a very important research source, or this comes from such and such an institution, which is very well regarded, but they won't. So enough. Then, then they ask you to rely on the the reputation of you know a named institution rather than actually showing you, for example, um, oh, I, like um, the people at um, uh, in the U.S. the the group that tracks um, donations, political donations, and lobbying efforts and campaign um, donations. Um, it's a, a nonprofit organization. Uh, and they will actually give you the dollar and look at the dollar figures year by year. So you don't have to ultimately trust them or their reputation, although that helps. But you can literally look at the dollars that have been given to um, uh, political candidates and, uh, uh, and or lobbying uh, efforts uh, in any particular year. It's that kind of data ultimately mm. that I think the consumer needs to have uh, available to really assess uh, how, how kind of legit. Mm. 
So I guess guess the obvious question here then is uh, how are you um, helping to provide that kind of uh, transparency? Because obviously the, the previous version of the Better World Shopping Guide that I've seen only gives a very, very summarized kind of rating for, for each company. And at the time, at least we spoke last time, I think there wasn't really any way for consumers to kind of burrow down in your research and see see your kind of thinking, your logic with that. Well, there is... Uh... I mean, there was a, at that point, and, there, and it happens to be on the website because there is this, there is a tension here, and and this brings up a, a whole other issue between mm. providing uh, all of the transparency and the data to consumers completely unwieldy to to utilize that data. So one of the important tasks is that on the one hand, you have to provide consumers with a very kind of tight set of solid rankings that they can use instantly anywhere, and that's where the better world. Shopper app comes uh, comes in. The shopping guide is this kind of balance point. The book where you can open up and you can see some of the actual highlights of data on the best and worst company. You can see some of the issues in the industry, and then on the website you can go on, click on the research link. There's like I think six or seven categories that are now broken down, and you can see some of the data points. So you can go and see, for example, you know um, the fair trade status of a particular chocolate or uh, uh, are certified by um, the series people with a particular ranking on on global climate change efforts, and then you can take that and go to the series website and see how they've done that research and find out you know how they did the rankings and what kind of integrity is behind them. So you can kind of go out there and discover that on your own. But having to do that while you're in the supermarket or while you're in the shopping mall is um, is untenable. Mm. So on the one hand. Um, available on a number of the industries so that at least consumers can go and see like to the data point um, what data that I'm using in, in the system that I have uh, and on the other hand they can go out and and instantly because I have to say there is an issue that has come up that um, I, I think it's very problematic that goes a little bit outside of, of what I mentioned before which is just the rankings diverging from these various efforts and that is that um, that there is an effort by a number of these organizations to allow consumers to customize their own rankings, mm. to take um, uh, a set of values. In some cases, it's three or four values, like community or environment or social justice or you know governance or what have you, and to rate them on various scales. Sometimes it's 10 or 20 values. Like, I don't care about animals, but I do care about the environment, and I don't care about social justice but I do care about the community. And uh, this kind of customability, I think, uh, customizability really speaks to this idea that, oh, every individual has their own individual set of values, and thus we can't force this kind of major set of values on people, and they have to be able to choose, and we're all unique individuals. However, once again, um, the problem with this is, is that once you begin to instill this idea of, like, you can kind of customize the whole thing for yourself, you end up with that of... of um, uh, efforts than uh, than the, the person next to you. So your good company is their bad company, and their mediocre company is your good company. And and the problem is is that because ethical consumption is so early in um, its development at this at this stage, as a system of communication between consumers and companies, it is still fairly primitive. Kind of all kinds of really mixed, hyper individualized. Mm and atomized messages company's doorstep based on where the dollars are being spent is so scattered it's unreadable uh, so they don't know whether they're doing good they're, they don't know whether they're being encouraged or discouraged by consumers that are uh, um, using their dollars ethically that at least at these beginning stages with the levels of sophistication that we have with the data that we we have with a company have a focused effort on overall social and environmental responsibility rather than you know uh, this kind of atomization which often plagues progressive movements in general which is like oh well we're the animal rights people and we don't care about uh, the, the you know your El Salvador uh, workers issues and so you know we're gonna fight for our issue to be number one and we don't care about when in fact all of these issues are linked mm -hmm. and um, all of the issues are linked together and if you try to part End up just kind of uh, collapse. So uh, I think it's very important that we begin to get into discussions around this idea that, you know, let's rate companies on their overall efforts moving forward and not try to kind of parse down to these like little tiny mm. micro messages that I'm going to send you a good, you know, in a perfect world, this would be an excellent system. And, and I agree, like, you know, 20, 30, 50 years from now, that is the system that we're 
looking for live in and exist in today. Um, we need to be able to, for example, agree on whether or not Coke is uh, a decent company, a great company, or kind of a, um, a laggard in social responsibility that needs to be sent a message like, hey, pick up the pace, uh, you're not doing so hot in this mm -hmm. area. And if we can send that message uh, as a group of global ethical consumers, I I think that message will be heard. Mm. Our kind of dis distance and our kind of like micro values, uh, those messages will never get heard. The messages that will only come through are the messages of, you know, oh, I love the new lemon flavored Coke and or your, I love how you turned the Coca-Cola label blue this year instead of mm. red and, and all of those things, which which also, you know, sway public opinion. Mm. That's, that's a really interesting way of, of thinking about it because uh, I was going to kind of pick up on that earlier that when you were talking about kind of data and how to present this to the consumer, it seemed like um, a very kind of one-way thing, as as if um, you know there's some source data and it gets piped out to the community, uh, to the end consumer, possibly as you say through this kind of um, personalised view on the data. Um, whereas what you're talking about here is that actually that kind of data-centric personalised view kind of potentially fragments the community, and as kind of maybe by uh, focusing just on that that kind of data-led process, we're actually forgetting the the end goal which is actually to to influence the companies and to talk to the companies essentially um you know backed up by by uh, real spending power um, but actually trying trying to communicate something to the companies and, and change the companies is, is that a good interpretation of what, what you're saying yeah i mean again for me it always comes back to um my, my touchstone in this work in general is um, functional democracy. So when you have a functional democracy, what you want is you want communication between the citizens and uh, the representatives. And when you send a message to the representatives, you know, you either have them change or you end up changing them through voting them out of office and someone else into office. But if the messages that are coming from from the citizens, it offered. Um, you won't ever get a kind of focus change from the representative because they're not really sure what to do with those messages. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, you know, companies are ultimately to uh, dollars as votes. And so if we want to send messages uh, to change these companies' behavior, we have to make sure that the communication is clear. And we do that by uh, focusing on the kind of overall message that we want to send and then collectively um, sending that message on a consistent basis so that they, they hear the message loud and clear. And the more kind of consistently, cohesively, the more... Um, send uh, the same message, uh, a consistent message to these companies, the more uh, likely that they are to change. And in fact, I mean, one of the things that we've talked about, but are not as involved in the consumer end, but rather in a business-to-business -business end, um, is that many companies out there have now set aside a pot of money to deal with this thing called, you know, ethical business or social responsibility or what have you, what to do with the pot of money. Now, some of them come in very cynical and they spend it all on PR efforts to get their reputation up as a green company when they're not actually doing anything. Others sincerely, you know, try to do um, uh, the right thing by consumers and by the, uh, the environment and the rest of the world, uh, and yet um, struggle with how to communicate that they are different from the people who are just putting it into PR, that they are actually doing the things that the consumer are most interested in because they only have a certain amount of money to do it with. Uh, and so many, many businesses are actually kind of stuck in this place, not exactly sure where their efforts would be most lauded, where they would be most acknowledged. Uh, and this is a, a, an important piece of communication that we have to reconcile because if they don't understand what they need to do to make us happy, then they're going to kind of constantly stumble along the ways. Even, and, it, particularly the ones that use efforts. So clearing up that line of communication uh, is exactly um, uh, what we need to do in the ethical consumer realm, just as if we want a functional, representative, uh, useful democracy, we have to be able to do that um, in the political realm. All right. That's, that's a really interesting uh, way, way to look at it. It's been a really interesting conversation. Um, I'd like to just wrap it up there. We're just coming up to half an hour. So um, thank, thanks a lot for speaking to me. Sorry, you cut out just at the, the last bit. <laughs> Basically, thanks. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot, Jonathan. I appreciate it. <laughs> Cheers. Speak soon. Take care.